Good morning. Welcome to Books at the Bottom of the Stairs. My name's Loreen. I'm talking to you at the bottom of our dock, looking at the bridge that goes across to the Medway River and eventually to the Medway Harbor. And this is my husband's favorite view. First thing in the morning, he likes to come down with his granola, and yogurt, and coffee and just sit here and contemplate. So, I don't know what he contemplates. I like thinking about the birds uh, on those, there, those two wires there that go across. That's where the kingfishers tend to gather and they tend to dive down through there. Quite often more at low tide than at high tide. And uh, across the way you can see our neighbors. He's got a collection of heavy equipment because he likes to do road grooming and stuff like that. And this is off in the distance is a long floodplain marsh and it consists of this kind of grass that you see in the nearby but uh, it goes on for ages so if ever the river floods oh, sorry gang the wind caught the caught the video guy uh, if ever it floods it'll go back in through there so as you can see our shoreline is not very high that's it you know that's about four feet and then that's another two feet maybe and you're looking back at the at the sleep bunk and the uh, canoe which hasn't been out this summer okay i hope that doesn't nauseate you as i come back to the rock and there is the rock and i don't think you can get really a good sense of scale but it's a fair there's my there's my toes give you a sense of the scale of the rock okay what am I going to talk about today? Well, somewhere around the teens of August, let me see if I can get you a good view. Uh, one of, I'm not going to be able to link anything in the doobly-doo below because, as you know, I don't have internet connection and we have to go to a local cafe to upload our videos. So, um, I think it's called, hmm, is it Drinking by My Shelf? I think she is hosting a history nonfiction week in the teens of August, and um, I'm not really participating seriously. They've got one of those grids where you can get different prompts and uh, give you ideas as to what kind of books to look for. But the basic challenge is to read at least one nonfiction um, during that uh, ten tenish days. She's not very firm on her. Uh, days because it's just a relaxed kind of a challenge. So I picked up a book a while ago that I thought was going to be you know, pretty cool. thought I had really done some clever discovery. Now I hope these letters, I'm not sure whether this will come to you in a mirror format or whether it reads properly. Jane Austen's Transatlantic Sister, The Life and Letters of Fanny Palmer Austen. Well, as you can tell by your last name, She's actually a Fanny Palmer before she is an Austin. So it's not actually Jane Austen's sister. It is Jane Austen's sister-in-law. And Fanny Palmer married Charles, Jane Austen's brother. And he was in the naval um, forces back in the time. And uh, so what we're really reading is a story about Charles's military career naval career and Fanny tags along she writes a few letters and uh, it's um she's young when we meet her 17 there's almost no background history um, there's quite a lot of supposition based on the societal norms and a lot of her letters uh, with Jane and um, the Austin family have been lost so we don't really get a very good sense of um, Fanny's early years, then we don't get a terrific sense of her early, late teens, early 20s either. She's mostly writing to her sisters in the Bahamas. She was a Bahamian girl, um, British Bahamian, and, um, you know, well-connected. So it's an interesting book, but I felt that we were really not getting what the title uh, led me to believe. So... Uh, I, she actually, this gal, Fanny, was in Halifax for quite some 
uh, time, well, no, that's a bit of an exaggeration. It was a few months at a time. It seemed long because it could take so long to journey from Bahamas to Halifax, which was a fairly standard thing to do in those days because the British uh, naval forces used Halifax as their northern gateway for defensive and offensive actions and the Bahamas as their southern point. So there was definitely a lot of travel between Halifax and Bermuda. And um, yeah, the, the history of Halifax includes that. But and as far as Fanny Palmer goes, she came two or three different times. Once when she was pregnant with one child and another time when the um, both girls were, she was not pregnant. She had two children at that point, but only here for a few months. And we see a little bit about her social life. Really, I didn't get a sense of the premise of the book at all, that um, Jane's military um, portions of her books were influenced by Fanny's letters. Um, I think maybe more so from her brothers. I, I, I think the whole thing was a bit of a stretch. So I think it was an interesting book. I certainly got to know an awful lot about what was happening in the naval world at that time, but I did not really see the connect to, connection to Jane Austen. And at a certain point, I just kind of faded out because I picked up another book yesterday, or two days ago, sorry, it was Steve's birthday pre-celebration. We went to Halifax, or I'm sorry, to Lunenburg, to our two favorite bookstores, and um, bought a whack of books. And uh, one of the, well, the funny thing about it was that we all thought that the bookstores and the restaurants and everything were closed on Mondays, which is Steve's actual birthday. But it seems, and now with the opening restrictions lowered on COVID and so forth, a lot of these places will in fact be open for Monday. So we celebrated his, his birthday book buying spree a little bit early, but that was okay. So while I was in Lexicon Books, picked up this one. Jane, I hope the printing is going to work for you. Ooh, how can I do that? Sorry. Let me see if I can do a better reach there. David Attenborough's Life on Earth. And oh my goodness, I love it. I really enjoy natural history. And this goes back to trilobites and brachiopods and all that sort of thing. But it, it talks about these beings in their environment and um, what, what, well, there was a big discussion this morning. Steve had to get onto the Googler to find out what exactly it was that trilobites eat and what do flatworms eat and so forth because um, David Attenborough talks about plant life on Earth eventually when the mosses and all that kind of business come up out of the um, out of the ocean, but it uh, doesn't really talk about kelp or seaweed or grasses or anything like that. So I'm not entirely sure. Oh, there's just the cutest little warbler. Can I catch it? Oh, it flew off. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, it's really fascinating. He takes us right back to the very beginnings, but I think what Attenborough does is he gives us a really great context. You can really kind of feel the muck and discusses how the volcanoes were behaving and the soil and well if you don't like that kind of stuff you're never going to be interested but uh, I found it quite fascinating so I'm at the beginnings of plant life on earth and which ties in nicely with another nonfiction book I read last year which was um, Mosses and Lichens by um, Kimmerman Kimmerman how no how's her name go Sorry, gang, you're going to have to look it up yourself. Um, oh, Sweetgrass Braided is her other book. Everybody was reading it and is still... Anyways, this is her. that was her first book about mosses and, and um, fungi and so forth. So uh, it ties in neatly with that. And I'm just on chapter four, so did not look in the contents. I'm not entirely sure what's going to be coming my way, but he's a very good writer. I'm really enjoying his writing style, and uh, the topic appeals to me quite a bit. So I also, just in the interest of expanding my knowledge of Nova Scotian um, black history, uh, I have Pearlene Oliver.
Canada's Black Crusader for Civil Rights. She was a Nova Scotian woman, and she was pretty influential in uh, the Viola Desmond appeal. She was also the founder of the uh, Nova Scotian Association for the Advancement of Colored People. She was the first woman moderator of the African United Baptist Church and a Chatelaine Woman of the Year. A lot of you probably don't remember. Um, oh yes, the other thing she did is she kicked the book Little Black Sambo out of the, uh, the reading curriculums for Nova Scotian schools. Um, Chatelaine women, I, for, I remember this back from when I was a kid, that Chatelaine magazine used to have Woman of the Year. And uh, it was a big deal. It was quite an honor to get that particular award. And uh, I guess that sort of thing isn't quite so so prevalent today. Um, anyways, this uh, Perline did win that. And so it's a thin book. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, there we go. And it is... Uh, Breton Books, which I believe is out of, is it out of Newfoundland? Hmm. I'm not sure. Breton Books. You'd want to say Cape Breton, wouldn't you? Um, yeah, I'm not seeing it. Anyhow, it's a local history book. It also uh, feature. So both David Attenborough's and this book, I should have mentioned the author, pardon me, sorry gang. Um, hmm. It doesn't say who the author is. Oh, it's edited by Ronald Kaplan. Okay, so both those books tie in quite nicely with the history challenge that I was talking about in the beginning. And in terms of fiction, I am, this cover, I've taken the uh, jacket off because I, I'm always worried that I'm going to wreck them. This is a real pretty little cover. Oh, no, no, my arm isn't long enough. There we go. It's a real pretty little cover. And um, it's one of the new releases that I was looking forward to, Alatso. And it is written by, the last name is Little Badger. She is a Canadian author. Darcy Little Badger, and it is illustrated by Rovina Kay. Kay. Let's see if I can get you one of the illustrations. Black and white, very pretty, very soft. So the um, story, is that, I'm just made an assumption that it was Canadian, but maybe it isn't. No, you know what, I bet it isn't because it takes place in Texas. Okay, assumption fixed. All right, so Alatso is an alternative world, North America, Texas, where magic, ghosts, vampires, all that sort of thing do exist, but that's not in a, a violent or upheavalish kind of a way. It's more of just a natural, um, just like some people have freckles and some people have knobby knees. You've got people who have um, paranormal abilities or connections. And so um, <clears throat> uh, Ellie's cousin Trevor has been murdered and his ghost has come to her. She's a ghost walker and told her that he has been murdered. So they've traveled to where he used to live and uh, they are searching for his murderer. And um, Trevor more or less gave it away who the murderer was, but now the challenge is going to be finding proof of such a thing. And um, so modern technology, there's cell phones, there's planes, there's also ferry rings that people can travel through if they know how. And it's just a kind of a fun little book. I'm not 100% sold on the writing style. I like the plot. I think the characters could have been a little more fully developed. Um, I'm, they're, they're doing good action, but I'm not really getting a sense of the depth of their thinking fairly it's fairly task oriented let's say so I don't think the character development was that deep now I also don't know whether there's a difference in storytelling methods by uh, First Nation authors because this is definitely connected into the story ways of the First Nations the the La, La Pen Appalach no 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 I'm sorry Apache, there we go, Apache. So maybe there is some um, uh, storytelling traditions there that I'm not clued into, and there also the <clears throat> the mythology and the stories of the Apache is not something I'm familiar with either. So 
it could it, it could very well be connected to these things and I'm just not tuned in properly so um, okay the other book that I am looking forward to this is kind of hot on t booktube right now is the house of the cerulean sea by tj clune quite a lot of people have recommended it and uh, linus baker is a buy the book case worker in the department of charge of magical youth at 40 he lives in a tiny house with a devious cat and his old records for company but his quiet life is about to change uh so i'm looking forward to that one sometime this summer um I, what i haven't shown you guys is a huge box I have of books. Now I'm going to do something really dangerous. I'm in my Birkenstocks and I'm walking on that big rock. Very bad choice of shoe wear for this kind of thing. There you go. On the left, sort of, let me see if I can point. Okay, through there, that's where the brook comes out. So, so that's all flatlands through there. And you can't see, that's not even the tip of our property, but it kind of curves around. A brook kind of in and around and then our property is like a little peninsula so we have water on uh, three sides and um, why did I why did I got totally distracted there by showing you the pretty view okay so what was I talking about I don't know there's the chair and that takes us back to the boat land launch and, oh yeah, I was talking about the big box of books that I have. So I'm going to have to add some of those books into the box. It's in the, in the back seat of the car uh, because I have a box and Steve has the same size box. And between the two of us, um, if we had all the box inside the cabin, there wouldn't be any room for the bed to pull out. So we keep them in the car and switch them out as uh, we finish reading them. And this year, which is kind of interesting, usually I sneak into Steve's box if I'm getting a little bit restless with my books. Um, and this year, he's sneaking into my box, which is kind of fun. Um, well, I guess that's it for me. Uh, the wind is starting to pick up, so who knows what that does to the sound quality. And uh, I hope you all continue to have wonderful reading dreams and adventures on this overcast August month that I love. I actually love this kind of weather. There's a wind that keeps me cool. I like being a little bit on the cool side and uh, keeps the mosquitoes down. So for those of you who are just pissed off by this overcast sky, I just, it's to me, it's beautiful. All those shades of gray. I don't know. It just, it's spooky. It's atmospheric. Anything could happen. The sun could come out. The birds are pretty active. Yeah, it could thunder. Oh, you should have been here yesterday for the thunderstorm. My goodness. It started off in one corner and it circled all the way around. And in Nova Scotia, we don't normally get thunder, like maybe two or three thunderclaps. And that's about the end of the thunderstorm. And lightning a little bit more so, but thunder not so much. Oh my goodness, that thunder went on and on. It was about three hours and sometimes the thunder rumbled so much that the, um, the curtains wobbled. And it wasn't the wind because we had everything closed. Yeah, it was a pretty exciting day and it started off with this kind of atmosphere. So anyways, I like it. So I say again, I hope all your reading dreams and adventures continue to come true and that the month of August is good for you. Bye bye for now.